the big headline measure is probably, of course, the Chancellor saying that he will um, you know, be plumping for cuts to national r measure rather than the income tax, given the latter is seen as more likely to attract the attention of the public in the headline. So for full analysis, and I guess there's no extra rabbit, this is one of the things that we were talking about. Of course, to help me understand the longer-term consequences of this is Stephanie Flanders. Stephanie, thank you so much for sticking around. So there was a package, there was a lot in there, but it was all pretty much expected. Yeah, and that's what's striking. I mean, I've got one eye to the, um, the documents. Of course, the moment that the Chancellor sits down is when you actually find out what was in the budget <laughs> because you can then you get the full details of the numbers and possibly the numbers he didn't mention in his speech. But it was I was struck um, by a couple of things. Firstly, there was nothing there, I think I'm right in saying, that hadn't been trailed, which just shows how completely the theatre of the budget has just sort of disappeared over the last 10 years or so as we've had progressively more and more leaks. I mean, I can remember when I first started in um, journalism, you know, it was extraordinary for there to be any pre-budget leaks and there were even resignations over it on some famous occasions. So that, I think, was very striking. And Stephanie, for that, I mean, is it because they don't want to surprise the markets or just, just they're testing things I think, out? I think it's that you get to control, you get to control the narrative. You get to, and then, and then they are playing with relatively small numbers. Um, I think even smaller numbers in a sense because the Chancellor has made that decision there had been so much focus on the public service numbers, public service spending numbers on the other side of an election. Um, he did uh, make the decision that he couldn't make those any tighter. Um, and so that has sort of limited the room for manoeuvre elsewhere. It's very striking that the, the, we, we've got used to talking in terms of the sort of head, headroom um, for, for meeting that rather odd uh, fiscal rule that they have that the debt must be falling uh, in the fifth year of the of the forecast um, it's now around eight I think just over eight billion um, which compares to an average just since 2010 of sort of more like 27 billion um, so it just you know that is a number that's not even a six months worth revision of the numbers I mean that can revi that can change with one month's tax receipts numbers so I think you know that shows how um, fast he's close, how close to the wind he's flying. I think the other thing I would say is everything that he's done that is obviously political, getting rid of non-DOMs, you know, steals something from Labour, makes it, puts pressure on them to explain where the money's going to come from for their plans. He's done in a way that is actually, does, at least on the face of it, look sensible, looks like something that, you know, the typical economist would um, endorse. Yeah. Um, national insurance rather than the personal tax rates, things like that. S uh, Stephanie, so on the non-DOMs, he basically said the government will abolish the current tax system for non-DOMs to get rid of the outdated concept of domicile to make it fairer yeah. and simpler. I mean, is he just... It know? was a super old-fashioned system. I mean, it dated back and it had been sort of amended. They'd introduced the charge for non-DOMs. But I suspect that having a four-year sort of, you don't have to pay tax for four years and then you pay tax like anyone else and we try and encourage you to bring your assets to the UK. We may, you know, some of the sort of famous non-DOMs in the UK may leave as a result of this who've been here for a long time. Um, but it, it looks sensible to most people who have previously engaged with what was actually a very archaic regime. Yeah. Let, let's also bring in Marcus Ashworth from Bloomberg Opinion. And Marcus, um, the Chancellor was also saying that, look, he's going to raise public spending by around 1 percent. I mean, how's the market taking all of this? Fine. I mean, uh, as Stephanie's saying, there was not really much that we didn't know about. Um, it's quite extraordinary how it's been leaked. I'd imagine the Speaker, if he had a bit more courage in the, the moment, would be rather annoyed about it because I just don't think that there's the way it's, it should be done. Nonetheless, uh, it's pretty straightforward, uh, a rather dull budget in that Why sense. Why don't you think it's the right way? Well, it should be announced do... to Parliament. That's, how it, that's the whole purpose of it. So, and, and Parliament should see it and hear it first rather than leaked out through various newspapers. But that's the way of the modern world, and I think it's uh, not a good thing, but that's by the by. As far as the markets are concerned, 265 a billion of new gilts coming in the next year, which is sort of the higher end of estimates. So the gilt market's got a lot of supply to digest. It will be a net record amount uh, for the market to divulge and, and take down. Um, but at least there hasn't been what I would say wanton income, cut, uh, income tax cuts, which means the Bank of England doesn't necessarily have to uh, get overly concerned about the government's fiscal stimulus, right. which means they could, in theory, when inflation as the OBI are expected to go below 2%, probably right. by May, that means they can cut interest rates, which is far more important, right. far more important interest rate cuts than tax cuts. And I think 
Hunt sort of recognised that. Yeah, and, and so this doesn't feel inflationary. Stephanie, is that fair? Yeah, I'm just looking at the numbers. I mean, there's the, the, the forecast is actually, I think, that the inflation... He talked about inflation um, falling back to target in the second half of this year. I think most of the forecasts we have show for the inflation going back up again um, towards the end of the year. But I, th I think inflation overall has obviously l looks lower in these numbers than in the, last, in the, in the autumn statement. Um, and I see that there's also a lower forecast for bank rates. So, yeah. Yeah. The interesting yeah, we're thing... going through the, also the OBR, basically, if you look at their, their new forecast, they've just dropped, right? And they show that the tax burden is still expected to rise in the coming years. Yeah. I think it's interesting is, the, is their growth forecast, the OBR, which is significantly more, more generous than what the Bank of England thinks. Uh, and I, well, I would say probably more in line with what we think is what the OBR has come out with. They tend to be a little bit more generous, the OBR, than perhaps the reality. But uh, that, if you look at these numbers and how they've all played out, Hunt is, as, as Stephanie's saying, saying very close to the win, only headroom of $8.9 billion or something. That could evaporate very quickly. Uh, let's also go to Lizzie Burden, who's outside Parliament. Lizzie, I know that there, I mean, we have a great blog going that uh, Stephanie and her team are, of course, following. Um, Alex Wickham has just written, look, there are seven new tax rises in this new budget. And so he says, you know, non-DOMs, there'll be a new vape tax. There is a one increase off in tobacco duty. Oil and gas windfall is extended in, in, into, of course, it, uh, an extra year. What else was a key takeaway for you? Well, Francine, the reason that they've had to do all these revenue raises through tax is because they've kept the public spending growing. This was a surprise. Uh, actually, there were expected to be cuts to public spending, but planned growth in day-to-day -day spending uh, is going to be kept at 1% in real terms. Uh, this is to fund, of course, as you mentioned, the big announcement, which was well-trailed, the cut to national insurance, not income tax. So this comes in from the 6th of April. As as you say it's going to be cheaper less inflationary and it has the added benefit of incentivizing people back into the workforce hunt says it'll lead to higher growth and also to pay for it as you say they've stolen labor's political clothes both on extending the windfall tax but also on the non-dom status so it means that labor can't spend that money on what it wanted to the nhs and education because it's going to fund tax cuts instead to get out of the hypocrisy of uh, where Hunt had previously defended non-DOM status, he said that uh, they introduced this new measure where there's a four-year exemption when people arrive into Britain. And then if you look at some of the other business measures in this budget, uh, you've had good news in the sense that he's raised the business VAT threshold. So this was creating an incentive for businesses to keep their turnover below a certain level level to avoid paperwork, but it's a smaller level than uh, lobby groups had asked for. You also got, as you mentioned, that British ISA, which has given the FTSE 250 a boost today. But the bad news is, Francine, there's this one-off rise to non-economy class flight duty. So less business and first for anyone that was looking to do a work trip. Yeah, Lizzie, thank you so much. So at the moment, we also have actually quite an empty chamber because there's what we call a division, and this is a provisional application on the stamp duty and VAT measures. Now, we understand this has been called for by uh, the Scottish National Party so that they're forcing a surprise vote on some of these provisions. I mean, it was a very rowdy bunch. Yes, it was. And so if, if enough MPs basically say no, this always happens on TV, no, 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 then they have to call for, for a vote on certain things that they announced. Yes, it's always a, 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 an interesting, there's always something new about uh, Parliament you never quite knew about or, or <laughs> come back from ages. But look, I think it was, uh, I'd rather hope Hunt had a better range of jokes. Uh, he didn't make one or two, but normally they're a, a bit better than that. So uh, all in all, I thought it was a fairly... Um, boring budget in some senses. I don't think he's done anything major, other, you know, a five thousand rise on VAT threshold isn't really going to plead that many plumbers. Um, so it, it's not going to move the dial, I don't think, on polling. So as far as the market's concerned, and certainly as far as electoral prospects, I don't think he's done anything near sufficient to alter the but, inevitable outcome. But I guess, Mark, Mark I mean, what, what, would, what could he have done without breaking the bank? So who was his budget That's for it. anyway? But it's their own self-imposed fiscal straitjacket, which is, looks more and more inaccurate the whole time it goes on. Nonetheless, it's their rules. It's not the OBR's fault. They, they're doing what they're told. So it's just, uh, unfortunately, we're in a situation whereby, you know, we obviously spent an awful lot of money during the, during the pandemic, and that, this is still holding us back. 
It's, although, as a straitjacket, it's a remarkably roomy one that allows you to increase depth <laughs> every single yes. year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and at the same time, it's bond vigilantes. Right? Yeah, well, I think the gilt market, as I said, it's slightly more than they may have expected, but not, you know, out of the range. So I think that's uh, going to keep gilt yields the highest in Europe, as they are, and I think they'll stay tracking very close to US Treasury yields, and uh, that's going to be really down to the Bank of England uh, sometime later this year, hopefully a bit earlier than, than currently expecting, but maybe when the ECB probably cuts in June, I think we may see the Bank of England move fairly soon after that. Yeah, and Stephanie, as soon as the Chancellor had finished his speech, we also heard from the Debt Management Office unveiling plans for bond sales, and they were, I think, a little bit bigger than expected, um, about £265 billion pounds of gilts from April. I think we're expecting 258. I mean, it's not a huge amount, but it means they're probably confident. Yeah, and I think it is, I mean, it's something that we're seeing, obviously, in the U.S. as well. The numbers are sort of boggling. I mean, it's just that there is just a question hanging over everybody, you know, how whether the gilts of this level can actually be absorbed by, by markets and what kind of long-term effects that's going to have on long-term interest rates. I'm just sort of flicking through. I think a couple of things that people will ultimately want to get into, you saw that very eye-catching, um, in addition to sort of holding on to these very tight spending plans that were already in place for, next, for after the election, um, there was this uh, initial sort of upfront investment in public service, public sector productivity, which, of course, governments are always trying to do. Um, but he has, uh, Jeremy Hunt has made that, you know, has made a real push on that. I think there'll be quite a lot of focus on whether that can deliver, because he's effectively saying you can increase the quality of services quite significantly over the next few years without increasing spending. Um, the other thing, which is just kind of buried in all these forecasts, although he kept repeating, he kept saying, it was interesting, he said, if we're going to have growth that's not reliant on migration, mm -hmm. trying to remind people of all the migration that had happened on, in the Blair Brown years, um, we must do X, Y, and Z. But part of the, one of the things that's made the numbers slightly easier for him is a 300,000 net migration increase in the forecast um, from the OBR. So we have, it, there's a sort of recognition built in here that we have had a substantial increase in legal migration, and that's probably going to continue for a while. And Stephanie, I mean, and this is the, I mean, the thing that surprised me the most with the U.S. economy is productivity. How much was that due to actually immigration? Well, and so the, I mean, the U.S. has had this striking thing where they've increased productivity, and there obviously have been a lot of people coming over the border, um, but yet they're still sort of getting more out of people at the margin. That's obviously not the case in the U.K. We've had this extraordinarily bad, um, bad record. But yeah, the, the, we still don't really see how migration is going to come down, legal migration. Uh, Marcus, on, on the British ISA, I mean, an extra £5,000, uh, the FTSE 250 is getting a little bit of a lift on the back of that. Well, I don't think that will last long. But, I mean, I think that's... Uh, what he, least he didn't do is when insist people had to sort of either sell foreign shares to buy British ones or indeed make it a, a separate sort of, you know, 10,000 for British only and 10,000 for the rest of the world. He's added on top the, by the absolute bare minimum. As I said, all these moves he's made have been about as small as you can possibly get. Uh, they're eye-catching for a moment, but I just think most of this stuff doesn't really ma make much difference yeah. at all. But we had the, we had the you know, be Chancellor for a day game. He probably he <laughs> hasn't crashed the economy, I, right? He has not crashed he's, the economy. Whether he's got the Conservatives re-elected, I think, is probably less clear. Um, but he's done... I mean, I think, you know, we, this was someone we, we heard uh, and we saw. He was enjoying it, you know, which he might not have been. Um, in some ways, he had a lot more kind of presence and, and oomph about him than sometimes the Prime Minister has when he's giving these kind of speeches. And he clearly was enjoying some of the reforming aspects. You know, it's been a while since we've had a reforming Chancellor, and he hasn't had much chance, but he's giving it a go. Stephanie and Marcus, thank you so much. Marcus Ashworth from Bloomberg Opinion. Stephanie Flanders, our head of economics and government. We'll have plenty more throughout the day. This is Bloomberg.